Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the uh, Hudson Institute to this session on meeting the challenge of the Chinese Communist Party during and after, there will be an after, COVID. I'm Louis Libby, the Senior Vice President at Hudson, and I'm here with several of my colleagues who I'll introduce in a minute. It's hard to judge a crisis during the crisis, uh, but the COVID one is going to rank high for the first part of the 21st century and probably in back into the 20th century. 9-11 uh, was an enormous shock. People at the time expected it was a matter of when, not if, we would be hit by much worse. The 2008 financial crisis um, led be some people to believe the system was tottering and would crash. The Chinese believed it, act, it marked the end of the uh, U.S. economy's hegemony. Um, it turned out those were wrong uh, based on actions that we took at the time. It's hard to judge a competition during the competition. 1957, Sputnik led people to believe that the new Soviet man was surpassing us, particularly in technology, and that America would not catch up. In 1980, the Soviet Union was on the march. America was caught in what seemed to be endless stagflation. Interest rates were in the high teens or low 20s. And again, people thought our time had passed. Today, China seems the greatest threat in 30 years. Some might say 80 years. The question is, what will we do? Some scholars believe that post-COVID, China will be poised to take off that the U.S. day is passing. Others believe Xi's position is actually quite brittle. As a strategic culture, the Chinese highly value deception. I would guess much more than probably any major foe we have faced in 80 years for sure. This makes it even more difficult to assess what is the actual challenge and where we actually sit. As we meet today, Chinese deception is largely responsible for Americans dying around the country. So to address this threat and assess where we are, I have three colleagues with me. They're well-recognized experts on China and Asia more broadly. We'll begin with John Lee, who's a senior fellow. Uh, he flies the Hudson Banner down under He's a professor at the University of Sydney. From 2016 to 2018, he was the senior national security advisor to Australian Foreign Minister Bishop. Uh, he's an expert on the Chinese economy and Indo-Pacific security. And I can say from personal observation that A, American officials are not always the least arrogant people around, uh, and B, that I've never seen one who didn't want to know what John Lee had to say. Patrick Cronin um, is the Asia Pacific Security Chair and a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Um, he does a lot, spends a lot of time and is one of the most productive scholars I've seen on the free and open Indo-Pacific and the problems therein. I've attended several of the Mount Fuji Dialogues, which is the premier Japanese um, a conference every year on um, Indo-Pacific security. Uh, and I can say that among 300 or so scholars who attend the sessions where Patrick speaks are always well attended. Uh, scholars, like everyone else, votes with their feet and they're always there for him. Lastly, Eric Brown, senior fellow at Hudson, uh, focuses on Asia and Southwest Asia. Uh, he has a particular expertise in looking at alternative political futures, which may be quite relevant for where we are in the middle of a competition, in the middle of a crisis. Uh, his, per his work on China's March West 10 years ago was prescient, and his work is widely praised by the highly renowned internal think tank at DOD, which considers him one of the very top people they have found on China, India, and problems in the region. So what I'd like to do is ask them to make a few introductory comments, perhaps starting with John Lee. And 
John, there's been a lot of talk about where the economies sit and what implications this may have for the Indo-Pacific. And I wonder if you would make some introductory comments and perhaps along the way touch on that. Uh, thank you, Lewis. Uh, Eric and Patrick, great to be with you from uh, Sydney in Australia. Well, it's clear to all of us that the Chinese Communist Party is trying to find opportunities to uh, advance its standing, its interests and its influence despite unleashing uh, this pandemic onto the world. Uh, we see this in a way that the Communist Party promotes its supposedly decisive and effective uh, response to COVID-19. Uh, it tries to contrast its response with what it calls a sloppy and chaotic response by the United States. Uh, more recently, it's been ostentatiously sending masks and ventilators and even doctors to all parts of the world, uh, as if to suggest that the People's Republic of China will help save the world while the democracies and in America in particular is uh, floundering. Uh, I'll frame my next few minutes or comments around the economics because I think there's a very common argument out there at the moment which goes like this. Uh, yes, it's true that in the first quarter of this year, it was an economic disaster for China, but China is now at the tail end of the pandemic and uh, the virus is, was a severe event for China, but a temporary event when it comes to national capability. So it's true to say that the virus didn't lead to physical destruction of assets as occurs in a normal war. The country's capital stock wasn't destroyed, the industrial base is intact, the knowledge and people capital in China is still where it was three months ago. So there's now this common assumption that as China is emerging from COVID-19, uh, while the world is still in lockdown, uh, China will spring back onto its feet uh, and be in a position of uh, even, uh, and will be in, in a far more powerful position uh, than it was before in relative terms. Now, the PRC is clearly in a different phase of uh, dealing with the pandemic compared to the democracies, but the pre-pandemic economic realities for China uh, hasn't changed. China is not a self-sufficient economy with a sufficiently large and sophisticated market to be completely in control of its own fate, uh, as powerful as uh, the Chinese uh, uh, economy might be. So neighbouring economies, for example, are now struggling and they cannot absorb excess Chinese uh, supply in the short term. Now, in the longer term, and I think this is, uh, this is where we really need to focus, China is formidable. Uh, but what China wants to achieve strategically and politically, China needs continued access to external markets, external capital, external innovation and know-how, and most of all, from the United States. So this is precisely what plans such as Made in China 2025 and to some extent the Belt and Road Initiative are all about. Now, for the moment, the United States is obviously preoccupied with managing uh, COVID-19, but it still has some powerful cards to play. And I think the uh, United States and allies should deploy these strategically. For example, uh, there are ways to restrict China's access to US financial and capital markets. And I think there are sound strategic reasons to do that. Uh, many Chinese state-owned firms and national champions are included in American benchmark indices, uh, which means institutional and pension funds invest in these Chinese companies. That can be reviewed, and I know uh, people like Senator Marco Rubio uh, is a leading advocate for this. Uh, there are around 160 listed Chinese firms uh, with a combined market capitalization of about a trillion dollars on US exchanges. These are the same firms intrinsic to China's Made in China 2025 program. Uh, there are broad powers available to the president to block transactions and freeze assets in US dollars. And this is a powerful tool because most global transactions are in US dollars. Uh, 
Uh, when it comes to restricting Chinese access to markets, particularly the United States market, now that only works, of course, if there are non-Chinese alternatives and this issue is playing out uh, over Huawei and 5G. Uh, I've noticed uh, that COVID-19 has significantly changed or is changing European views on China and has certainly hardened Japanese views. Uh, and on high tax sectors, particularly those nominated in the Made in China 2025 blueprint, uh, now is the time to come up with common standards, export import controls, and then common investment regimes uh, to develop market ready alternatives uh, in, in sooner rather than later. Now on restricting Chinese access to know-how and innovation, then clearly needs to be better coordination with Europe because uh, Europe is really the primary source of technological and know-how leakage uh, to China in the world. Uh, China is great at integrating technology and commercializing technology, but it still gets most of its innovation and know-how from the advanced economies of the United States and uh, Europe. Uh, as mentioned, there is now more appetite in Europe to consider harder industrial policies against China uh, and more uh, cooperation on restricted entity lists between the United States and Europe uh, is both uh, possible and desirable. Finally, I think the US needs to do something about uh, Chinese students studying in certain courses in American universities that have strategic implications and to restrict the sorts of joint projects that American and other researchers can do with Chinese universities. This is a major source of knowledge leak uh, from the United States to China. Now, I think it was uh, Churchill who made famous the exalt exhortation that you should never waste the crisis. Uh, we have a global crisis, and while we manage that, we can ensure that something positive comes out of it. Uh, to make sure that we don't just go back to the place that we were uh, before COVID-19. Uh, thanks, that's my framing remarks and I'll uh, pass on to my colleagues. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, John. Uh, Patrick, um, I alluded in the opening to different views of how China and Xi are doing in this period. I noted that the um, Economist's most recent cover says, is China winning? Well, yes, and they've written a whole issue on that question, and it's an age-old question, really, especially over the last couple of decades, as we've seen China reemerge, and as we saw, the 1990s didn't put an end to history. So we're once again asking this question of, about the great powers, who's ascendant, who's in decline. It's very much the predicate to Graham Allison's popularization of the notion of a Thucydides trap, in which a declining and rising power embark on a trajectory of conflict. Uh, my short answer would be don't count America out and don't assume China's peaceful rise. And three points really about is China winning. The first one is as far as we can see right now, and we're far from the end of this pandemic. Uh, this is not a Suez moment. And that's a, a phrase that was dropped in the latest issue of Foreign Affairs by Michael Green and Evan Medeiros. I agree with half of their article. I disagree with what they've left out. but I certainly agree with their assessment that this is not a Suez moment. It's neither the retrenchment of the United States irreparably from the Pacific, that's not happening. Um, it may, however, accelerate some disentangling of our critical supply chains and our high technology innovation sources, and it should. Um, and that, that, that could be a good thing, but that's not a retrenchment, that's not isolationism. And meanwhile, um, it's not a Suez moment uh, because China is not poised really to fill the gap. It's beset with internal troubles that are compounded by this pandemic. And it has a poor track record already of, about trust and transparency. And both of those ideas have been uh, magnified, I think, by this crisis. And, and that will constrain its appeal to the region and the world. The second point would be simply that um, we have to acknowledge that Xi is, is making the best of a tough hand. Uh, he did take what first appeared to be a Chernobyl moment uh, and turn it into an opportunity. Mind you, it still may be a Chernobyl moment for Xi's leadership. We'll know that in a couple of years. 
for the Chinese Communist Party, it seems uh, a more resilient party, um, uh, something that uh, authors like Bruce Dixon have written about it at length in his book, The Dictator's Dilemma, that we underestimate sometimes the adaptability and the, and the agility of the CCP, even if we don't like its policies. Um, but it could be a watershed for Xi, if not the party. And the third point is, is the most important one, which is the United States and our allies and partners get a vote in this competition. And so COVID-19 is altering the near-term landscape, but it's, it's not quarantining our alliance architecture. It's not putting a, a lockdown on, on the strategic competition and therefore our strategy that we need to compete successfully with uh, China. And that means both uh, following age old uh, sort of strictures of preventing a hegemon from rising, preventing uh, threats from crossing the Pacific to our uh, to the United States, um, but also finding a level of cooperation that is based on, and this is the key point of cooperation, genuine reciprocity, not the pretense that China's uh, narrative would like to put. So for those reasons, I would say uh, China is not uh, winning, but it is early in this uh, pandemic. And it's early in the strategic competition to know what the outcome will be. Eric, since um, Nixon's opening to China and Deng Xiaoping's trip to Disneyland, China has liked to portray itself as the, you know, the favored developing nation of the world. Uh, this has had certain consequences. Is COVID changing this or how is the world going to see COVID going forward? It's a subject that both uh, John and Patrick alluded to. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Scooter. Um, I mean, COVID has certainly accelerated something that's been going on for quite some time, and that has been the general unraveling of the cooperative foundations of the Sino-American relationship. Um, you had mentioned Nixon's opening. Keep in mind that since the 1970s, China, the Communist Party in particular, has had to face an enormous number of rolling internal crises of different magnitudes over many, many years. However, throughout that whole period of time, the CCP regime has had the cooperation of the world's advanced democracies in which to deal with that. So for example, in the 1989 Tiananmen massacre, when the Communist Party was facing a rolling um, rebellion against it, not just in Beijing, but in other key urban centers in the, in the Eastern Seaboard and elsewhere. There was a debate in the US government and in Tokyo and elsewhere about how we, would, how we should respond. And at the end of the day, the decision was made first in Tokyo and then in Washington that uh, what might come after uh, the party crumbles in China was something too fearful. Uh, and so people made undertook great efforts um, to uh, help shore up the CCP regime, despite the fact that we uh, um, were, were horrified by its conduct. But recall what happened in the course of the 1990s. There was a lot of investments, a lot of um, easing uh, China into the World Trade Organization, among other things. And this was all done on the basis that cooperation could be sustained and that the more expanded cooperation we had with China itself, the CCP regime would eventually relinquish some kind of control over China, that it would eventually remodel itself in ways that will be uh, beneficial um, uh, for China's overall uh, integration with the world. But the reality is, is that the party couldn't handle that. Um, and that became very clear after the 2008 financial crisis, when instead of liberalizing further, the party, I think, made the analysis that if they were to integrate more with the world, then they would accelerate their own demise. And for a large part of the party, uh, the decision was made to not liberalize, but to do the opposite. And since 2008, uh, the party has been asserting greater control over all aspects of Chinese life, the economy, uh, the political, the ideological discussion in China, among other things, and shoring up its rule in ways that um, have parked back to an earlier period of, of Maoist totalitarianism. Um, 
Uh, the party did that again because it faced a risk and what it wants to do the most. The party says this in its own Leninist charter. It worries about its own self-preservation. It worries about its own power the most. So it needed to reassert control. Anyway, it was that decision that has since accelerated under Xi Jinping that has led to the deterioration of U.S. PRC relations, not necessarily, and, and because the party in effect has been doing what it did back in the 1950s that has been attempting to turn China against the United States. But it's been zealously guarding its power. And in the process, uh, as I said, this has accelerated under Xi Jinping. The party has made a decision to launch, among other things, the Belt and Road Initiative, which um, is essentially a strategic gambit meant to create a more supportive world order that will allow the party to maintain its monopoly of power at home. It has been, um, uh, we've been tracking very closely, as you're well aware, uh, supporting a massive mil military buildup, particularly directed at the Western Pacific and the East China Sea and the South China Sea. And it's been pressing unfounded territorial claims across the Western Pacific against a number of nations and then also across the Himalayas uh, against India and others. Um, this has led to a lack of political patience in the United States. And so now the PRC, which is facing a massive crisis at home, does not have the cooperation of the advanced democracies which it had relied on in the past. Um, and I think that this is going to have a major effect on its performance in dealing with the crisis that it's facing. Among other things, the economist had predicted that China's economy would rebound something like nine plus percentage points in the next uh, in the next quarter. That, of course, assumes a lot. And any geopolitical risk analyst who's just come out of geopolitical risk 101 would would take all of the assumptions that went into that projection to task. The one thing, though, that it doesn't that it that basically assumes is that PRC is going to have unfettered uh, access to international capital markets. Um, but it's very clear that um, the political argument has been rising here in the United States um, uh, to restrict uh, PRC's access to uh, U.S. capital markets, particularly if we're talking about PRC state-owned enterprises that are not held to the same due diligence standards that American companies are, but particularly if those companies are involved in the buildup of either PRC's police state, the massive um, atrocities and persecution that's taking place within China itself, and particularly if those companies are involved in building up um, uh, military capabilities with which the PRC is attempting to reshape the strategic realities in the Western Pacific. Um, Roger Robinson, among others, have been leading a push um, uh, in the administration and in the U.S. Congress to try to uh, ensure that we have much greater oversight. Again, simply holding the SEC up to its, to ask it to do its job and to do dil due diligence on companies, PRC companies that are involved in the American stock market, among other things. Um, I think in the Trump administration, there's been a rolling debate between the so-called black hats and, and white hats, uh, the, the national security team and the international financial team about, um, uh, about what kind of new economic arrangement with the PRC we should be looking for. I think that there's been a general tendency amongst uh, American political leaders to postpone large decisions until the elections are over the U.S. elections, but the pandemic has clearly accelerated uh, this, and I think it's forcing a discussion both in the administration and in Congress. Fortunately, we haven't seen anything yet from the Biden campaign about this, but I hope that we will see something from them um, about uh, what our uh, best uh, uh, economic arrangement with PRC should look like going forward. Clearly, the United States has both a national security and an economic interest in clawing back vital industries, ensuring that our uh, supply chains for particularly sensitive um, uh, industries are protected and not held to um, the political decision-making of the CCP leadership. Um, uh, beyond all that, um, the PRC is going to have a very, very difficult time dealing with this rolling crisis. 
when it cannot count on the cooperation of the United States and Japan and others. Um, and so that's going to magnify all the problems that they face at home. And that will have implications both as for a referendum on Xi Jinping's leadership, as Patrick had suggested. It's also going to have implications for China's conduct, for the PRC's conduct in the years ahead. Um, uh, the party prizes itself on its nimbleness and, and tactical flexibility. It may be that this will force a change in the party's tactics. Um, certainly the criticism of the one-party state has been um, growing in recent years, and this has deepened since the pandemic, both within China itself, but also in the large overseas Chinese community and from other countries. Um, so it, it may be that this is the time when people begin to think about a more fundamental change in the CCP regime and the resentments that are there in China because of the party's failure to prevent this epidemic from becoming a pandemic and because of its uh, making a hash of it in a whole variety of other areas. It may be that this could be um, something that will inaugurate a, a, a process, a, a relentless but directed process of political change in China. Meantime, the party has been relying on jingoism and blaming foreign machinations on its problems at home. Um, the party relies on this um, to uh, whip up support for its rule because it knows that gratitude education and communist ideology are not sufficient to induce loyalty among the, among the subjects of the PRC empire. Uh, and it's been doubling down on the buildup of its police state at home as well. Um, and we've seen the Gresham and the, the new pronouncement in, uh, from the party leader in Hong Kong just this past week that some very controversial laws uh, that have been shelved since 2003 are likely going to be unrolled to roll up what they refer to as radical political movements and foreign influence in Hong Kong. So. I, I say all this because the incorrigibles within the party who are um, rallying around Xi Jinping at this particular moment in time are still have a vote themselves. And China um, is going to pay for this. Um, it also should tell us that we should be on guard and be thinking very clearly about the nature of the regime that runs China today and how uh, it uh, is not uh, willing to cooperate with us in the way in which we would like to cooperate with them. So I'll stop. Terrific. Well, I'd like to invite all of you to jump in as you wish. Let me just sort of throw one out to everyone. Uh, there has been this argument that under Xi, who is centralized power, uh, China can turn more quickly than it could under the collective leadership that preceded him. Uh, Claremont Professor Hay argues actually the prior collective leadership uh, was more flexible and more willing to hear debate than she has been, and that the end result may be more rigidity, people not wanting to challenge she, and that it may over time become brittle in the way that the Soviet Union became brittle. On our side, we may have a greater reality, more realistic, greater sensitivity to a view of China at this point, especially after the COVID, that it was building before COVID hit us. But we're also going to come out of this with a substantial amount of debt. And instead of the humming economy that we had before, whether it's a V-shape or a U-shape or a flatter recovery, uh, it will take a time to get back to um, the sort of confidence that America went into this problem with when it was negotiating the trade agreements. So how do you all see that, those two sides of the problem uh, working? Happy to jump in, uh, Scooter, and, and talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, mention Pei's uh, observation, which I think is right, that uh, the collective leadership that Deng Xiaoping onward uh, started to develop after the cult of personality of Mao led to a more rational, logical type of pragmatism. Uh, unfortunately, that fed into our uh, exaggerated hope for convergence through engagement. But putting that aside, uh, it did allow for more agility, whereas Xi Jinping has been putting forth Xi thoughts, you know, no term limits, 
greater repression, but very cleverly through information dominance that's a little harder to see. Um, and while he's consolidated all this power, making us believe that he may be in power for many more years, what the pandemic has thrown at him is a black swan that basically says in two and a half years, he may be having a farewell banquet and China may be going back and the party may be going back to the uh, debate between essentially the, the Maoist revolutionaries, now the neo-Maoists and the reformers. Um, and uh, it depends on what legitimacy is based on in China. And I think that's been evolving. It's not, it's not a simple calculation about who has the right to rule in the party. Uh, we have thought that economic performance was the key. And if you read the Chinese press as they try to defend their economic resiliency and what Eric was alluding to, the idea that now they've got the economists and they've got the IMF, INF and, uh, IMF and other institutions talking about uh, potential economic leadership uh, rebounding in China over the next uh, year and a half. Um, it, they obviously believe economic performance is still key and Xi thinks it's key to his his survival. But you see some a gap growing between Xi and other members of the Chinese Communist Party who are saying that, well, he may not be a real communist, he may not be you know, a real uh, party member. And so there is a fight going on with, you know, within the factions that we, we don't see. It's not visible, they don't write about it in China, you won't read about it in the Chinese press, um, but you can, you can glean some of it off of uh, Weibo and off of uh, some media comments that are picked up uh, by organizations like the Radio Free Asia that actually follow the Chinese and what they're saying very closely. But Xi Jinping has lost a lot of trust. You know, it, the Uncle Xi image uh, where he was the, the, the benevolent dictator uh, has lost ground to the Winnie the Pooh kind of image, uh, which is banned in China because it makes fun of uh, Xi's more doddering kind of uh, sclerotic leadership. It, questions his techno technocratic competence. So, you know, it goes back and you look at the anti-corruption campaign when he was taking down Boji Lai, for instance, and taking down the so-called tigers. Um, and you have to be very uh, skeptical of that anti-corruption campaign in retrospect, if you weren't at the time, that this was really about removing potential opponents to Xi Jinping's rule. Um, and just when he thought he had removed most of the impediments to staying on beyond two terms, suddenly the pandemic and the pandemic performance is calling into question whether he should be sticking around beyond a second term uh, after after the end of 2022. So um, let me stop there and, and let others opine. Eric, did you? Um, I would. Patrick had mentioned Boshi Lai, and and that I'm glad that he did because we should rem remember that Xi Jinping's ascent to power was a close run thing. Uh, and he had to go through uh, considerable purges from within the party to remove political opposition, even within the party itself. And he owns this policy. He and the people who support him within the, po within the party owns this policy that has effectively begun to isolate China and a lot of key part capitals around the world. Um, to, to lead it to de facto geoeconomic and geopolitical uh, um, quarantine in many respects, which may grow. And so the fissures within the party themselves are likely to deepen um, the more the pressure on the party uh, grows, uh, if it grows. Uh, among other things, um, you know, I, I saw a projection this morning that, that the CPP economy may be facing upwards of 20% unemployment. Um, that suggests that the party will lose a lot of the uh, economic uh, uh, base and political support from, from a lot of mid middle income people within China. Uh, if that happens, that's going to precipitate um, a lot of, of uh, a coming forth, if you will, of the fissures in the party itself, um, which uh, we'll have to see what happens. It, it's going to be very interesting. But the U.S., again, should keep in mind that these fissures within the party do exist. And in calibrating its policy, it should certainly try as best we can to encourage a more favorable intra-party outcome going forward. Um, certainly, uh, we have to ratchet up the pressure on it. Uh, China would be uh, much better off um, uh, without party rule. John, did you have a chance to uh, think about this question? 
Yeah, I thought I'll approach it about on on the American side. Um, every every economy, every major economy um, afflicted by the pandemic has launched a series of stimulus and have gone uh, quite significantly into debt. So, for example, uh, my country, Australia, from a GDP point of view, uh, we've actually thrown more money at trying to save our economy uh, than the United States. The United States still has, in a short, medium term, a unique advantage, and that is that it is the only real safe haven in the world. The Europe, the EU has lost a bit of that status. Uh, the Japanese economy by itself is too small. No one really will park any money in the long term in the Chinese economy. So what that means is it still remains cheaper and much more feasible for America to raise debt. Now, this isn't an argument that America shouldn't worry about uh, what the next decade and beyond holds in terms of managing the public and private finances. What it's saying is that uh, there is more room for the United States to move during and after this pandemic. Uh, and yes, the United States will have to manage its debt just like every other country, but the capacity of the United States to uh, continue business as usual is far more uh, potent than it is for other countries, including China. I can add to that. I mean, we're a democracy, so the first priority is to obviously stabilize the domestic situation. But as we think about the debt that we're taking on in order to rebuild, we have to also be thinking about where it is we want to be standing in this geopolitical competition going forward. I was interested to see that uh, the Japanese government um, included in their own stimulus plan uh, over $220 uh, billion um, to encourage uh, onshoring of Japanese industry and divestment from China. Um, uh, there's a significant portion of that $220 billion, I think about you know, 20 200 million or so um, that's been set aside to encourage uh, Japanese companies to open up um, new uh, enterprises and to involve themselves in other countries in Asia, for example, in Southeast Asia. So Japan is thinking very deeply, I think, about how best to position its economic recovery and to derive geopolitical benefit from that. We need to be doing the same. Um, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, it was from the very beginning, there was a lot of smoke and mirrors involved with it. Um, uh, and in a lot of respects, it really relied on having um, uh, sustainable returns from the advanced economies coming into the Chinese economy and lubricating that and allowing um, that to, for the PRC companies to take on an enormous amount of risk operating in other countries. Um, whose economies were not doing very well and which were taking on an enormous amount of debt to PRC um, by cooperating with it. Um, now, of course, the pillar of, of the advanced economies of the world um, supporting BRI, that's been removed both because of the pandemic and also because of, of, um, of the political considerations and security considerations that I mentioned earlier. That is really going to affect um, the party's ability to deal with the massive rolling debt crises in a whole lot of BRI partner countries that it's going to be facing in the years ahead. And the U.S., I think, needs to be thinking very clearly about how, how it can, again, use that to its own advantage. A lot of these countries um, which did take on debt to China did not want to become de facto dependencies of China. I worry now that um, the incorrigibles around Xi Jinping are likely going to press uh, a lot of debt distressed countries and seek to derive greater rents from them uh, in this crisis. Uh, anyway, that's going to create an opportunity for the Bretton Woods um, uh, international organizations to step up and to hopefully fill the gap and to allow countries some economic and hopefully also some political latitude to be able to um, uh, not become uh, de dependencies on the, on the PRC. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Scooter, if I could just uh, emphasize the one big point uh, that Eric made early on there about Japan and the fact that it's pivoting away from trying to have manufacturing in, in the mainland. I mean, it was already doing that before the pandemic, but this has made a clear conscious policy now for Prime Minister Abe, um, and they're putting money behind it. it. This is a very, very grave blow to how uh, China is going to reformulate their economic growth because they're already over leveraged. Um, the Belt and Road is already over leveraged as well. And now they're losing potentially the first and third largest economies, full throated support for economic activity with, with China. So this is a very important point. And those people who think that China is going to win out of this pandemic really haven't looked at, at how things will be have to be reshaped on the economy. But Eric is also absolutely right. America now must think, along with our allies like Australia and Japan and others, very clear eyed about our own strategic priorities and how we get the most bang for the buck on our return. The, um, the thing I would add is that America has to think very carefully about uh, which supply chains need to be repatriated back to America and which supply chains just need to be taken out of China. But it's okay if those supply chains are in friendly or like minded countries in the region. Because if the United States overreaches on uh, the reorganization of supply chains, it will just tend to um, annoy and distract uh, its allies and friends. But if there is a common uh, objective about increasing strategic options and economic resilience, then I think that distinction, what do we repatriate and what do we take out of China, um, is, 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 a, is a very important conversation to get right. John, you're absolutely right. I mean, we have to avoid an ends means mismatch because if we aspire to one thing, but we can't deliver, uh, we don't have the capability or even the need to do it, we'll, we'll fail. And we can't afford to do that. This is too important. We have to be very clear eyed about those choices. What really matters, what really needs to be protected? And then how do we make risk management decisions with allies and partners that are reasonable? Because, you know, listening to former National Security Advisor John Bolton today, apparently, call for uh, sort of the normalization of ties with Taiwan. I mean, aspirationally, I support that in terms of uh, a liberal uh, sort of values, but we, we don't have the means of making that happen uh, at an acceptable cost. So that's the kind of mismatch between our aspirations and our capabilities. Um, we, we have to be more realistic about our own limitations here, even while we have to be very clear eyed about the, the challenge that China's posing to our security. Yes, there are some comments out of the economic community. The shift to China was not just cheap labor, but also the availability of engineers. They graduate five times as many engineers as we do here. I can't vouch for the quality of the engineers they're graduating there, but they, we graduate a lot of them here that then go back. And the question is whether we can move some of that work with um, precision tooling and uh, high quality work on production lines, whether we'll be able to move that back right away. It's a sound coming out of some of the manufacturers who are manufacturing in China, and it could be a justification rather than a reality, but it's out there as an argument. But even there, Scooter, we can, you know, that's going to take time for thinking about how we rebuild our own manufacturing base, our own technical base. The education component is huge. But if you think about a successful kind of program that both Japan and Germany have run in Thailand, for instance, one of our two Southeast Asian allies, they actually provide the technical education in country, and then they hire them in country for German and Japanese companies working in Thailand. So that goes back to John's model that you know, some of this can be done in the region. Some of it's going to have to take investments back home in America. Earlier, you mentioned the Thucydides trap. Uh, which was an argument that came out in a book by a renowned professor not so long ago, which argued that, in effect, the real problem here uh, is that a status quo established power, the U.S., resents the rising influence of the, the coming power, China. Uh, it turns out this argument was first aired, as far as I know, in the modern period, in this connection, 
in China. That it was in effect an argument that, oh, you Americans are going to start resenting us and opposing us. And in a way, again, I started off with comments on the Chinese expertise and deception. In a way, it's an attempt to manipulate the market before the, before the market hit. You have views on whether it's rational for the U.S. to be acting as it's acting, um, whether COVID changes the picture for the body politic. Well, I, I certainly have a lot of views on this topic. Um, if I could just start with a few words. Um, you're right that the Chinese Communist Party brought together their best and brightest and debated uh, in closed sessions initially and then widened the circle over the last couple of decades about uh, China's arising power and its emergence, how it would naturally run into problems with the uh, resident uh, sort of existing status quo power of the United States. So that fed a lot of research that came out in academe as well as in policy circles. Um, and there are legitimate concerns and fears, but that kind of um, sort of linear projection uh, is not the way history usually works. I mean, history, as an old historian taught me early on, is oblique. It comes at you from angles, just like the pandemic came at us uh, from, yes, in one way, predictable that we're going to have pandemics in the future, but this particular pandemic at this time was certainly a surprise. I, I think when you think about China's concerted disinformation campaign right now, um, you have to say this does not look like an overconfident China to me. This looks like a China that may have been overconfident uh, during the global financial crisis 12, 13 years ago but has lost a lot of that confidence because the economy was already slowing down. Their Belt and Road Initiative, their signature brand, while it had some appeal, was starting to be tarnished by the reality of what it meant in terms of debt and non-delivery. Um, and now you've got a pandemic that truly threatens potentially uh, Xi's leadership that he has built up around himself and that China dream based on Xi and Xi thought uh, very much being uh, looking like a very brittle read on which to base uh, sort of uh, the ascent of China over the United States. So while there's legitimate concerns that the United States should have of China and that China can have about America's reluctance to bring China into the international community, the reality is the United States has done more than anybody to facilitate the rise of modern China. Um, and, 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 and what we've seen over the last decade is the slow gradual realization in the United States and elsewhere that China was taking advantage of the institutions we built after World War II was uh, gaming the system. Uh, and what they called cooperation on the surface was under the surface all about uh, intellectual property theft. Uh, what they would call cooperation on the surface was really all about uh, very much a zero sum game where they were trying to gain advantage. And this information disinformation campaign right now is instructors do just final thought on this it they are literally trying to divert by saying hey it wasn't me we didn't you know we weren't the origin of this or we didn't cause missteps we didn't cause the spread to be worse um they're they're secondly trying to use disinformation to disrupt it's over there by the way it's the united states because that plays into the the communist party's long-standing view that the united states is the main source of insecurity for the Communist Party. Why is that? At the root, it's because of our stand for individual freedom. That is anathema to the Communist Party's sort of uh, principles. And then thirdly, the disinformation is all about displacing us. They still, while they don't believe it as much as they did 10 years ago, they're now uh, still very much trying to finesse this crisis so that they can look like China's ruling. China will lead the World Health Organization even though it has a corrupt leader. Uh, who was co-opted by the CCP while he was still in Ethiopia as health minister. Um, and China will provide masks and, and public health goods, even if some of the equipment is defective. And China will um, insist on the rules that are made in Beijing when it comes to the South China Sea and a code of conduct, for instance, as they push around uh, Thai, uh, well, Vietnam and the Philippines and they, and they harass Taiwan. Um, and they threaten Hong Kong as well with further crackdowns. So all of this disinformation campaign to me suggests that they don't believe that the city is trapped. Uh, they believe instead that uh, they're not sure about their ascent. They thought it was pretty, pretty locked in. Uh, 
and now they're having increasing doubts. And, and the answer may be for them and for the party to push Xi aside earlier than he thought, um, but to reconstitute under a new leadership. If, if I can jump in here, if you look at the last roughly 30 years of Chinese strategic writings, but more importantly, what China has been doing over the last 30 years, my summary is that a large part of it is to, or was to bind American power, circumvent American power, undermine American power, or manage American power. The point is, it's all about trying to uh, get a competitive edge uh, against the United States and structurally uh, at least contain, if not, uh, if, if not restrain the United States. Now, I had um, I had a, a drink with a Chinese uh, friend in this field who, who's quite balanced about these issues late last year, and he said to me, frankly, I'm surprised it took the Americans this long to react to us the way that the current administration is reacting now, because within China, they know that they've been treating America as not just a competitor, but as a rival for a very long period of time. Uh, so, in terms of how I characterize what's occurring now with this administration and most likely the ones to follow, it's really recognizing the reality of what China has been doing, all those sorts of things that Patrick raised. Uh, now, how we respond is a different issue, but I think there is now clear recognition that uh, America has been misled, has been naive, uh, and it's really just correcting the imbalance that has occurred for a couple of decades. Yeah. That uh, protracted war uh, that the CCP regime has been conducting against uh, US power and the liberal order in general, that's in the Maoist DNA of the party state. And the tragedy is for China is that they never had it better. Um, certainly in the last 150 years, as Patrick had suggested. I mean, the U.S., uh, certainly post-1991, has done uh, an enormous amount to facilitate China's rise, again on the assumption that continued cooperation would lead to um, uh, reasons for more cooperation. Um, helped the CCP regime to work through a whole variety of problems that it had, reshaped the most benign security environment that the PR, that China and the Chinese people had seen um, since the 19th century and um, the coming of the uh, first the European seaborne powers and then Imperial Japan. Um, we wagered after World War II that China would play a major role in the construction of a more peaceful anti-imperial order in Asia. And that assumption was, was higher in our agenda in 1945. Um, but when China itself fell to the party, we, we, uh, it's very clear that the party has been um, doing everything that it can to control China's interactions with the world and to conduct this protracted war against, uh, against uh, um, institutions um, uh, outside of China. And that's not going to end so long as uh, China continues to live under a one-party dictatorship. Getting towards the end of the period that we usually set these out, I wanted to ask another question and give you all an opportunity to jump in if you like with, with uh, additional closing observations. Uh, the, the question is actually twofold. One is you both you all have mentioned at one point or another attitudes from other countries, and particularly I think Europe was mentioned a couple of times as to how they've been reacting to the COVID problem. Um, do you see a meaningful change coming out of Europe, which will assist uh, in restraining these bad proclivities that can come out of China? Second question, which is not unrelated to that, are recent rumors or supposedly sources in the White House saying that the COVID the novel coronavirus actually came out of a Wuhan lab. Not that it was an engineered or intentional bio release, but that it was an accidental release. And do you see that as having any difference from coming out of a wet market um, where they trade in wildlife, which is also known to be a dangerous situation witness the SARS epidemic? 
Uh, may, maybe I'll have a first stab at that. On restraining China, my my or restraining the worst aspects of Chinese behaviour, my take is that China has been able to do what it has and achieve what it has and have the mindset that it has because it essentially has met no resistance. There have been very few costs for China of behaving uh, in the way that it has you know, over the last, uh, particular last 10 years, but more 20 to 30 years. And even though this current administration has got some things wrong, what it's got right is that it's the first administration willing to call that out and seek to impose costs on China. And I think we will find that if this continues, uh, China will have to recalculate like every other country has to recalculate. Uh, but the point is that that need to recalculate costs and benefits of doing what it's doing, it hasn't had to do that. So if I were the Chinese, if I were in Beijing, I probably would have done what they would have done because they met very little resistance and paid very little costs. So that needs to change and I think that will change. On your second point about the source of uh, COVID-19, whether it's a wet market or lab, my the main focus or the main the main thinking I have on this issue, it's not necessarily how it started or how it was inadvertently leaked to the rest of the world. It was how the Chinese Communist Party, when it knew about the danger, treated it, both with respect to the interests of its own people and the interests of the world. Uh, so it's not about where it started. It's it's more about how the CCP responded when it knew the truth of this pandemic. And I think this is where the conversations change because prior to COVID-19, it was all about how do we uh, get a slice of the opportunity with China exports. Now the conversation is increasingly, how do we avoid the problems that China tends to export to the world or how do we defend ourselves against those problems? That I think is, is quite a serious uh, change or development for the Communist Party. Jumping in here, Scooter, I mean, I, I think there's a great opportunity for America leadership here to mobilize allies and partners around the world with a very positive message um, that is in the interests of our countries without ever even mentioning China. But obviously, we still have to think about European concern over 5G, for instance, and asking us not to push too hard on making it a black and white issue. But there will be tough issues, but I think we have an enormous diplomatic opportunity. We just need to be using it. I'm, in Asia, I can't help but think about our ongoing protracted negotiations over a special measures agreement with South Korea. We ought to be looking right now, the administration ought to be looking right now at announcing a joint commission, US and South Korea, on the lessons learned for how to deal with this pandemic and future pandemics. When you think about what Moon Jae-in just pulled off in terms of his party's victory in the midterm elections that were just held this week in South Korea, even though the South Korean leading ruling party was seen as inevitably going to lose this election because the economy was doing poorly and the one signature policy of President Moon outreach to North Korea was not succeeding. And yet here, here the Minju party, the leading party, um, won a landslide victory because of their handling, their perceived handling of the pandemic. That wasn't perfect, but it, it, it grew increasingly um, to be effective. And that's what the United States needs to be joining with allies and partners on responses to the health crisis, to the economic crisis, and to our long-term security challenges, including the supply chains, the high technology, out of this pandemic and look like we know what we're doing. I think on the virology lab, um, it's an important point. I mean, for me, we don't know the origins and we're not likely to know them easily because the Chinese will keep denying experts access to the evidence and to the lab in question. Um, when you think about how they have vilified those who have even brought up the question that this could innocently have leaked out of a natural specimen out of the virology lab, it makes you wonder that we just can't trust what, what China's government is saying about this issue. And I don't think the people of China ultimately uh, trust them either. That's what we that's what we take away from Fang Fang's famous chronicle. She was the writer who chronicled the daily life during the 11 week lockdown in Wuhan. Um, and now they're vilifying her book because it's being read around the world um, and it's too popular. We just can't trust the data coming out of out of Beijing, unfortunately. 
and we just may not really understand, but we have to be prepared for the fact that uh, even natural specimens uh, collected in a virology lab indeed are capable, if they're not properly maintained and, and monitored, could indeed start a pandemic. And that may well be the source of this, this global crisis. Eric, you have any final thoughts? Just to reinforce what John and Patrick had said, I mean, we can't trust the data that comes out of China because the nature of the CCP regime distorts it. And to both the party's uh, will and it's in, in the light of its political goals, um, but also because of just the tyranny that, that people live under, uh, not wanting to necessarily cross the party in the wrong way. Um, uh, this was certainly one of the reasons why local officials uh, uh, responded so directly to Beijing's directive to crush rumor mongering when we saw the epidemic first begin to present. Um, I think a key task for American diplomacy the American political leaders is to make sure that the world uh, remembers that um, because the party, as it has in past crises, tries to rely on American attention deficit disorder and uh, the natural amnesia that catches on in, um, in democratic societies uh, about things like this. But the deep structure of the CCP regime is what is principally responsible for uh, generating this pandemic um, uh, and allowing the COVID-19 to become a pandemic. And we need to remember that. And, and that needs to be uh, something that we should assure that our allies in Europe and our allies and friends in Asia are all on the same page on that. This cannot be forgotten. Terrific. I don't mean to cut you all off if there's any Final thoughts, uh, encourage them now. Otherwise, I think we we're sort of at the end of the period that we normally allot for this sort of thing. Unfortunately, the problems are much greater than the amount of time we've set aside. So. All right, well then, thank you all very much. Uh, it's been terrific having you on. Thanks. And I look forward to seeing you back thank at you. the shop where we can go back to the shop. See you, John. You won't be there quite as soon, I hope. No, but I, I, I'm counting down the days. Great. See you Thank soon. You. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you.